If it hadn't been for uh, a lady by the name of uh, Harriet Luella McCollum and an unanswered prayer, I wouldn't be here tonight, or she got me started in this. I suppose that she, in her day, was the outstanding woman psychologist in this country, at least. And I'm quite sure that she was the most eloquent speaker uh, in the ranks of women lecturers. And one of the clearest teachers I believe I've ever come in contact with. Her approach to God was entirely mental. And she came up from a very hard school. She was married to a, a ne'er-do-well man who was always living on the fringe of poverty. One of those indolent, slothful types of characters who really never get anywhere. And she had two children by him and she was approaching 40 years of age and entirely frustrated and unhappy. Working as a chambermaid in a tent colony in, in Coronado, California. Uh, and like most mothers of that kind, had great ambitions for her children and wanted at least to see them get a, a good education. She was as neurotic as anyone could be without getting into an institution. And there she was stuck, hopelessly defeated. And a psychologist, a, a sort of a wandering psychologist, uh, came to that city, San Diego, and he gave a series of lectures there. And she read it in the paper and got on the best togs that she had and went. And in the first lecture, he said that he was going to give them a secret later on. But he dragged the thing out for seven nights, never did give it. He drew a part of a mountain. He started out with a mountain. Uh, he drew f the foothills on the blackboard, and he got them up a little piece. And then he announced that the next night he'd take them on up farther. And so he kept baiting them with this secret he was going to give. And the last night came, and then he announced that he was going to uh, teach a class. And I forget now what she said it cost, but something like $100. And this secret was going to be revealed. Well, somehow or other, she, she got that money together at a tremendous sacrifice of her energy and humiliation and borrowing and everything else. And she took that class. And in the class, this was the secret the law of the subconscious mind is suggestion. And that was it. Well, that had been out for a long time. <laughs> but she had, had sacrificed to pay this money, so she decided to make it work. <laughs> the only one in the class who got any use out of it. And she put it to work, and the result was that she became 
Well, she had more energy than any anybody. She'd go like a blue racer all over the country, speaking six and seven times a day and just running like a racehorse. Uh, unlimited energy and teaching enormous classes. One class in Philadelphia had 2,500 people in it at $25 a piece. They carted the money off in suitcases and egg crates. <laughs> every place you went. In those days, uh, those were the days when everybody was trying to be successful and prosperous by tricks of the mind. And she was telling them about the tricks. And they would flock. <clears throat> How to use the mind. Well, she became a, a very brilliant speaker and a wonderfully wise woman. I'll say that if her teachings were sound on the level she had them. And uh, she had no, no heart in it. She'd come up the hard way and she'd lost her heart interest in the penury and pinched poverty that she'd lived in and the frustration and then when she became successful, why, she didn't recapture the hard side. And she was never unhappy in her, her, never happy in her success, always unhappy. Then she got a hold of my book, Love Can Open Prison Doors, and read it and became enthusiastic about it and got in touch with me and asked me if I would... Uh, uh, give a series of eight lectures in the old Trinity Auditorium in Los Angeles. And I had not lectured uh, in the social world at all. And I said yes before I had a chance to think. <laughs> and uh, the next day the publicity was already on its way and I got in touch with her to cancel the situation. And she said, the publicity is already out. You've got to go through with it. And I began to pray that no one would come. <laughs> I didn't know it, but while I was praying no one would come, Marie was slipping off down to the auditorium and going in there and standing and praying that it'd be full. <laughs> And her prayer canceled mine out. <laughs> and the night I got there, it was jam-packed full, and they were standing outside. I was in back and couldn't see. <laughs> she was going up and out and back again, and I'd say, how is it? And, <laughs> and I couldn't see anybody, and I didn't know what was doing. I was just sitting there sweating uh, octoplasm. <laughs> And she came, she would come back and look at her watch. <laughs> Finally, the zero hour came and I was going to get a chance to see whether anybody was there or not there. And we stepped out. <laughs> I had my notes and oh, a whole bunch of them. I had enough for a dozen lectures. <laughs> And I'd uh, been back there wringing them in sweaty hands until they were just all wrung up in a pile and a knot. And I got out and made a beeline for the piano and got on it. I held on. And she was introducing me and turned around to look and saw me hanging on the piano and... She said, turn loose of that piano. <laughs> and uh, I, tur <laughs> I turned loose, and then I grabbed a chair, back of a chair, and she was continuing to introduce and looked around and saw that, and she literally kicked it right out of my hand. <laughs> and then she said in a loud voice to them as talking to me, get out there and pitch. <laughs> I don't know how I ever got through it. I didn't know what I said, and I was just grabbing at any word that I could get into my mouth. I couldn't read my notes. They were, they had melted in my hand, and somehow or other, 
I got through that trembling like a leaf and just almost perished. <laughs> and it was so bum that I knew and was glad of it that that put an end to it. That, that, <laughs> there'd be no more. That would be the end. And the next night, more came than ever. And I went through that series of eight and adapted myself to the rhythm. <laughs> and uh, then we had a great debate in San Francisco. We were debating there 10 days, 10 nights. She took the side of the head and I took the side of the heart and we fought it out on the public platform in San Francisco. And when I got through with that, I was a veteran. <laughs> uh, I never did convince her. She remained to the end of her days, believing that God was mine and that the only real logical and reasonable and sensible approach uh, to God was through the avenue of the mind. She greatly deplored emotion. She lived a completely detached and monastic type of life, just as well as been in a convent. The most harsh disciplinarian I ever saw on, on herself. She never fraternized with the people she spoke to. She had no, no friends, no close friends. And she never had any association with her students. She lived a, an isolated life of meditation and prayer. And it was all mental and became an exceedingly lonely woman. Uh, hungering for love, but almost scorning it or scoffing at it. And finally, the most pathetic thing, she, the mind that she adored and loved so much and used so wonderfully well, broke on her, and she left this plane mentally unbalanced. That prayer, if it had been answered that night, and I prayed earnestly, I'll tell you, that no one would come. And if it had been answered, I don't believe I ever would have gotten adjusted to public speaking in public. But because of that series of eight lectures there, I did. I didn't get rid of timidity, but it, it was made possible for me to overcome it. And that has been so ever since. You know, I believe that everybody ought to do something in public speaking. I think it's a mighty good thing uh, to, uh, to overcome this innate, I'd say, inherited sense of, of shyness and inferiority, uh, fear of public opinion, fear of people's opinions, what they're saying. I think it's a mighty good thing. I wish everybody would uh, would do it, even if they never intended to make any kind of a profession or a vocation out of it, to uh, do it anyway. Well, tonight I'm going back and talk about some experiences. <clears throat> uh, following the days of my own great experience, what I myself was released from crime and the bondage of crime and deal with some of the things that occurred shortly after while still in the glow of that enthusiasm. For that afterglow lasted somewhere in the neighborhood of six months before it settled down into normalcy. And during that time, I. I really had great faith, and I had an enormous amount of love, and I saw uh, 
things happen that could never uh, rob me of my belief in God's willingness and power uh, to heal today. Uh, not only heal bodies, but minds and personalities and souls. Right after I had that experience, shortly after, I, the first thing uh, I noticed in the power that came was that the prison officials trusted me where they had never trusted me before. Always before, I had been kept under surveillance all the time. There were a number of times that my cell was moved right at the head of the cell block uh, where the night keeper was on watch much of the time. I was always being watched because I was always trying to get away. There was uh, never any trust placed in me. And after this experience, I was trusted and was placed in the the most trusted position inside of prison walls. I was night nurse in the prison hospital. And I had more authority and power than the keeper who was locked in there with me. For I carried a key to the dispensary, not only the medicine cabinets in the wards, but the dispensary. And in this dispensary were narcotics, grain alcohol, and bonded whiskey used for medicinal purposes in the hospital. And I had been an alcoholic and I had used drugs. Now I was trusted. I was also trusted by the state surgeon who made his visits there at regular intervals. He put me in charge of the operating room and all of the uh, equipment a sterilizing equipment. And it got to the place where he wouldn't operate at all unless I assisted him. He trusted me. I heard him tell the warden who was standing watching an operation uh, that he would trust me to perform a minor, minor surgery on his daughter. I had charge of the first aid room and I did perform minor surgery. I was trusted. I could have uh, released the whole prison hospital. In prison men are always dreaming of, of freedom and they will do anything under the sun to get into the hospital where they might make it. I've seen them eat enough soap that would kill a horse to get into the hospital so that they might have a chance to get away. Because at night there are no guards on the walls. And in the hospital, your room has an outside window and the bars were not case hardened. I could have released any a number of them if I'd wanted to, if I hadn't been trusted. But I had to be trusted not only by the officials, but by the inmates because I didn't want to lose their favor. It was, a, it was a great job and a great test and a great proof that all things work together for good in Christ. You don't win the, the favor, you don't uh, win favor by incurring favor with some at the expense of other, others. When Christ does it, he does it complete. I not only kept the favor of the officials, but also the inmates. And uh, only God can do that. There is no other power that can do it. And uh, so I was working in there, and one night uh, they brought in a man from the hole, at solitary confinement, in the wintertime, and the hole is very cold. The building would get full of frost in the winter, and it would sweat, uh, cold sweat, and the floors would get icy and the men slept on them, those cold concrete floors, and they had no bedding. And this man uh, had been in there about nine days on bread and water, and had become so constipated on it that 
he developed a locked bowel. And the, he complained to the doctor, but the doctor passed it up as uh, a guy just trying to work another angle. And of course, inmates are always playing angles. Uh, but he missed it this time. The man really was sick. And he stayed in there 24 more hours. And then this locked bowel threw him into convulsions. And they brought him into the hospital late at night. No surgeon there, not even a doctor. And I had to deal with him. The next morning the surgeon got there and just went in and examined. He said he has pneumonia. Not only that, he said it's very probable that peritonitis has already set in. We uh, couldn't possibly operate on him. He'd die. Oh, the only thing to do is to leave him alone. I asked that surgeon uh, if there was any chance at all. He said, yes, probably at one chance in a thousand. Well, I said, you're here. And since he's going to die anyway, uh, why not take that chance? He said, I don't believe he can survive the anesthetic. They just at that time introduced into the prison hospital sodium amytol. They had always used ether. But they had uh, just introduced it. I don't know how long it had been out, but we had just gotten it. And it was a local anesthetic. And I said, uh, won't you take that one chance? and see. And I was so persuasive and persistent about it, he said, all right. And we put him on the operating table. He gave him the sodium amytal. And I sat on the stool at his head. Uh, another man on the day shift, nurse, assisted the surgeon in this operation because I wanted to be at the man's head. And I sat there on the stool at his head and I talked with him. I talked soothingly to him. I told him to accept certain things, not to be afraid. Everything would be all right. And when this surgeon worked on him, uh, he began, I felt that his hands were overshadowed uh, by the hands of Jesus. And he worked more precisely and calmly than I had ever seen him work. He seemed almost as though he was transfixed in, his, in this operation. The concentration was perfect, and every, every movement of the scalpel was perfect. And he just worked as one completely detached from everything else but this one thing. And he took that lock out and he sewed the ends together and he uh, sewed up the incision and used 20-day cat gut on the man. <clears throat> and he told us to put him back and he told me to do whatever I could. He needed the shot to give it to it. Relieve him from pain that he probably wouldn't last uh, till the next morning. When he came back the next time uh, to perform another series of operations, the man was sitting in the convalescent room. He hadn't needed the 20-day cat gut for he was up in seven days. If there was peritonitis, it receded and disappeared. The pneumonia was gone, and he was happy and healed. That surgeon never did uh, get it out of his head. Now, he was a vulgar, profane man, but a masterful surgeon. But he never did get it out of his consciousness that there wasn't an extra marginal power 
in that operating room that day. And there was. For I was in that power. It hadn't, uh, it hadn't dissipated from my experience. And I was in that power and had a, had a confidence. I had an assurance. And it was confidence and assurance that made it possible for me to persuade the surgeon to operate in the first place. And it was that assurance that brought the man through. I believe firmly in, in spiritual therapy. I think it ought to be in our churches, but I think it ought to be in a rightful place in the church. It's a fascinating subject, and it's a needed subject. There is a great deal of glamour about it, and people are attracted to it, and there is an, in, an inclination uh, to make healing the central thing rather than the, the great physician. Uh, get centered in that and make that the, let the system of religion be organized around that. And so I've always felt that, that insofar as I'm concerned, there's a great mystery about it. I sometimes am completely confident about the will of God to heal and can and can find scriptures, pick them out of the Bible to prove that, and did do it in my book, Good News, about the will of God. And I think that it's a part of the nature of this spiritual therapy uh, to get that consciousness that it is the will of God to heal it. And that if there's any doubt about it, that kind of therapy can be sidetracked, it can fail. If a person, for instance, uh, puts uh, on his prayer at the end, if it be thy will, that can very easily indicate that he has some doubt about it. And if he has some doubt about it, he does not have that faith that is a blessed assurance, that is unmodified confidence. And in that case, the thing can fail. On the other hand, I, when I was out in the Orient, out in Japan, the man under whose sponsorship we labored uh, believed so firmly in divine heat. And uh, every place we went, uh, people would stand up and testify of being healed of tuberculosis and lots of that in that country, and even leprosy, and the cancer and everything else. And he was a firm believer in it, and he taught it. He taught his people that they ought to all be, all be healed. He taught them that they ought to live for 150 years. No need to die all. And I said to him, uh, what if they all did? <laughs> you've got 100, uh, you've got uh, 86 million here now. And uh, there's only about... Uh, three-fourths enough food to go around. And what if no one died? And you'd double that population. And he said you shouldn't bring up exceptions to the rule. <laughs> you lose your faith on them. Well, I said, what about Asia? It's all overcrowded. If your theory was uh, right, if it was true, if it were, if it were God's will, that everybody be healed, well, then nobody would die. And then what would become of Asia? Well, what would become of the world? At the rate that people were multiplying, especially in the United States, 
it wouldn't take long until we'd have the whole earth in a terrible mess. Well, <clears throat> those things get my consciousness. I can't help but face them. And so there are times when I'm befuddled about it and other times uh, when I am in that faith state and know. It's a kind of an in and out proposition with me. One woman told me that she could tell the day and the hour that she received the gift of healing. And I was thrilled about that and wanted to know more about it. And she said, but it's a strange gift. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, the first one I prayed for died. And she prayed for three people, and all three promptly died. And when she mentioned the second one, I that I was in good health. <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since I'd been to a doctor. <laughs> and that I wasn't in any particular need of prayer at that time. <laughs> And she said, well, I couldn't be mistaken. I can, I just know the day and the hour that I got that gift. And she said, I've wondered if it isn't a special ministry that's been given me. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe these ones I pray for are ready to uh, pass over. Well, I said, I've never seen anyone in a hurry to get to heaven. <laughs> and uh, I said, if it is a special ministry, <laughs> I said, I hope you don't practice it on me. <laughs> I know, I know God heals. And uh, in that faith state, I know it especially. And I know that he also gets us into a state where we can, uh, where personality is healed. In that prison, there was a friend of mine in the farmer days, an atheistic friend. I guess he was one of the most skillful atheists I'd ever seen because he had, uh, he had unfolded into atheism out of theology. And uh, he knew the Bible. And he was three times loser. He was a, a forger. And forgery is a disease. He had been three times in, and he had been a very warm, close, personal friend of mine. And we had been missionaries of the devil together, <laughs> and zealous, <laughs> and were always seeking to win one. <laughs> and. Uh, he could take a, an impressionable young kid who had just been sent in and just snatch his faith out of him just so fast he wouldn't know what hit him because he knew the Bible. And he could make the Bible, he could take the contradictions in the New Testament uh, and the inconsistencies in the historical life of Jesus. And he could so twist those things around, those inconsistencies and contradictions, until he made the book look like a, a fantastic piece of mediocre fiction. He, he was skillful at it. And he would take these youngsters whose minds were plastic and open, and he'd get them started talking about religion, and then he'd just take their faith right away from them. And I used to admire him greatly at his uh, ability and capacity. I admired his mind, and so we were pals. And then I got religion, and when I did, he said that it, uh, that I'd gone yellow. That was the report he put out. Over there in the hole, that's where I got it, I'd gone yellow, and had uh, taken uh, the course of the weakling that every other weak sister took when he couldn't solve his problems. 
It was his theory that every weakling turned to religion when they became frustrated enough. And he accused me of that now. And so I had to face him now as my enemy. And all the bitter things and stories he told about me, uh, it was awfully hard to bear because I couldn't get away from it. There was no escape. I don't know whether you've been under ostracism or not. But if you've ever been under ostracism, you know that it's mighty hard to bear. And when that ostracism becomes definite persecution, it's much harder. And he certainly didn't spare himself on me. But I continued in the state of love for him and continued to love him on a higher plane. No longer on the plane where he was. Knew very well that he would never bring me down to that plane again. And I had the utmost confidence that in the long run, I was going to bring him up on this plane where I was. And so it was a, a case of his spreading the antagonism and animosity and lies against me all over the place, while I could do nothing but secretly love him and pray for him. His prison name was Tumbleweed Jarvis. It was a nap name or he had been a minister of the gospel, and he had fallen from grace. That is, he had tumbled from grace and had become a weed in the garden of God. And they, they, have, a, they have a very skillful way in penal institutions of applying the right name to the right person, and they certainly got him tagged right. And so he was proud of that moniker and tried his level best to live up to it. And then one day, while I was asleep, he wound up in the hospital uh, with two perforated ulcers in his stomach. That night I came on duty, and there he was. I walked into his room and looked at him. I said, hello, Tumbleweed. He didn't speak. I said, what are you doing in here? He didn't speak. I had him under my thumb. He was in an awkward position. I had access to various kinds of medicines and mistakes could be made. <laughs> and I imagine he was thinking in his mind, well, I hope that religion was right. <laughs> and uh, I let him stew in that. I, I even prompted it. I told him about death. <laughs> and I said, here, they, it's possible to make mistakes. We have no embalming system here. We take, uh, we take our men out to the ice house, and uh, lots of times our boys are very careless, and it's possible for a man to go into a cataleptic trance here and be buried alive. Uh, I explain scientific things. <laughs> I let him sue there. And uh, I kept praying for him and loving him and letting him sue. One night I went in his room and he he spoke with semi-decency. And he said, I've been watching you. And he said, I, I'm trying to make myself believe that this thing you said you received, this conversion experience, was authentic. 
I'm trying to make myself believe it, but I can't. In the first place, as a theologian and as a psychologist, I don't think the grace of God operates in that fashion. I can see no reason why God could uh, bestow upon you any such uh, special dispensation of grace when millions of more worthy people are going without it. Oh, he, he was a thinker. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I don't know tumbleweed. Uh, all I know is that I looked up grace, and it says unmerited mercy. Well, I totally unmer <laughs> unmerited it. And all I know is that it was authentic. That you're on this level, and I'm up here now. And it's real. You hate me, and I love you. And I don't believe you can ever do anything to me, no matter what it is, uh, which would cause me to hate you. Because I learned in my experience that hate is the most destructive force in the universe. It destroyed you. It destroyed me. I kept loving him and praying for him, and finally there was an indication that he wanted to talk. And I was the first one ever to get his story, I guess. <coughs> and he told it to me uh, through the nights that we had together. He had been converted, and he knew what conversion was. He was converted when he was in high school. And he had slanted his, his interest toward the ministry and God's service. And in the, uh, he went to a secular college before he went to divinity school. And in college, he, he took up various things, uh, biology and philosophy and things of that kind. And, and these uh, things uh, had a tendency to corrode his faith a little bit. And by the time he got through college, uh, that primitive faith that he had at the time he, w he was converted uh, had had a pretty stiff shock. Then when he went, he went on into seminary and he was exposed to higher criticism and church history. And what was left of his faith vanished when he got through with that. So he went into the ministry without faith. But he was capable of preaching magnificent sermons. I suppose that he could organize them like someone organizes a, an essay. Uh, that he could <clears throat> make his points and get his emphases and, and preach a powerful sermon. And probably uh, impress people's minds with what he said. In fact, he told me that he could. But he said he had lost all power even before he went into the ministry to uh, move people's hearts. He just couldn't do it. He had a, <clears throat> a great store of information that he could communicate to people and their minds would receive it. He had the ability to make their minds receptive to, re to receive it, but he couldn't communicate inspiration. He couldn't quicken their emotions. He couldn't stir their souls. Uh, he couldn't enliven their spirits. Uh, he never saved a soul while he was a preacher. Not a single one. Didn't bring anybody. And... Uh, this fact, working on him on the inside, against the impact of his original conversion experience, uh, created a psychological and spiritual conflict within him. And this conflict 
uh, had him in such a state, I want to get out of the ministry and I, I want to stay in the ministry. I want out, I want in, I want out, I want in. And that was the kind of a conflict he was in. And finally, he married. And then he had someone to blame. Uh, before, he just blamed the congregation. Now he could blame his wife. And so he became a masculine nagger. And everything, he was always on his nerves and having temperamental fits at home and, and blaming her and accusing her until he wore her down and made her unhappy and she's married to a minister and couldn't get a divorce and stuck with it. And finally, uh, she contracted some insignificant illness and didn't have the will to live, the spirit to live, and it developed into complications and she passed away. And then he passed into guilt. And he said the guilt was so strong that it was almost like a red-hot dagger just stabbed into his soul and uh, staying there. And he couldn't get it out of his mind and out of his heart that he himself uh, was guilty of her murder. And this guilt moved him into a nervous crack-up. And after the nervous crack up, he had no stomach for the ministry. And in order to kill his conscience against the original experience that he had had and to root out all reality of it, uh, <clears throat> he began to dabble in agnosticism and went into the selling game and went to drinking, finally to gambling and eventually to forging. And he had his first hitch in prison, and by this time he was a confirmed atheist and a confirmed thief. And then two more uh, prison terms, the third one being this one. And he told me that. He said, <clears throat> he said, I've reached the place now where even if I wanted to, I couldn't recapture a belief in God. He said, everything about me is icy. <clears throat> I'm cold and empty inside. I just don't have any spirit. I doubt if I even have a soul. I'm impervious to anything that is pertaining to religion. I'm just case-hardened and incapable anymore of even wanting to be different. And I knew that right then he was confessing and repenting. I knew it. I didn't say anything about it, but I, I urged that on. I wanted to hear more about that, that analysis of himself. Or if I could get him to talk this way, I knew that I had him on a beam that was that uh, God was prompting, or it was confession. And it was repentance, though he was denying it uh, on the inside of him. And by and by, he called me one night, and he said, I would like, he said, with all my heart, to be able to feel God. If I could just know, even in my mind, that there is a reality, a spiritual reality. And I said, well, there is, whether you want to admit it or not. Every time you say uh, these negative things and doubt it, you're just simply not accepting what is real. But the very thing you're talking about is more real than the air we're breathing here. And if you ever get to the place where you're willing to accept, it's very possible that you can come into a state where you can receive. And then for the first time, he asked me to pray for him in his presence. 
Well, I wasn't used to praying, so my method of prayer at that time was meditation. Uh, I really didn't get used to the kind of praying you folks do till I, long after I was out here. Uh, I couldn't catch the knack of that kind of praying for a long time. The kind of praying that was revealed to me and was easily fitted into my own religious temperament was silent prayer, meditation. And so I told him that I wasn't used to uh, praying out loud, but I certainly would try. He made the request. And I talked to God about him and about what he wanted. I think it was two nights later that uh, he was in great distress in his stomach. And he called me, back, he knocked his glass on the chair. And I went and he was all doubled up and just burning like fire with these ulcers. Uh, one of them had bursted and a great fever had come there. And I went, sat down on the edge of his bed, and uh, it was in my mind, uh, this is the critical moment. I just had that feeling that it was. And I sat down on the edge of the bed, and I put my left arm under him, like that, and lifted him up, and I put this hand right on his stomach, and then I just sort of bent him over. I put my knee up on the, my foot up on the bed, my knee up. And I just bent him over and leaned him over with his forehead on my knee. And then I took the left hand and I put it on the back of his head. And I kept this hand there. And I began to be prayed through. No effort to pray at all. Uh, no, no prayer that I was making up. The prayer just flowed through. And then I felt the tensions going out of him after I'd prayed for some time. It's almost like uh, the current going out of a wire. These tensions were going out and he was relaxing and relaxing and then his forehead was on my knee and then he became so relaxed that the head just flopped over. And I laid him back down and he was asleep. He woke the next morning for the first time, I was off duty and in bed. It was 10 o'clock in the morning when he woke, and he was healed of the ulcers and healed of the personality and soul sickness he had been in. Completely healed through and through, physically, uh, morally, mentally, and spiritually uh, during that sleep state, and later became, I think, one of the most effective missionaries I've ever seen inside the prison walls, bringing young men especially to Christ. He had this background of the Bible, theology, he had all the bases back of him, and now that he had come back uh, through this dark canyon of many years and had tunneled his way back and was now back in the light, he had a tremendous ability to lead these young first offenders uh, to Christ. I know that if we get in the right state, and uh, that faith is a living confidence, not just an intellectual belief, but something that is in the very cells of our body, that we just believe it through and through. And we have that consciousness of it's a blessed assurance. Uh, if we get that, I just know that we can pray with effectual power successfully for almost any kind of healing. If you could come to this altar uh, tonight in that kind of faith, if you, ha if you could get into that faith state, obviously uh, we and ourselves have no power, but we're certainly going to try to do our level best. 
uh, to relinquish ourselves into the hands of Christ and uh, hope and believe that we can be his agents and instruments and it is his power that doeth the work and if you could come believing and accepting it is very possible that his power could be communicated through any one of us 